So I asked Ted, can you tell us what's going on with Moore's Law? You know, is this thing going to end? Is it that big of a deal that if it does end? And, uh, and do you have an idea what comes after Moore's Law? That's a great, uh, great question. And so from the, from the purely technological point of view, we figure that you will not be able to, using any known form of removal of heat, be able to go beyond about one nanometer in terms of, of uh, devices. And so we're going we're gonna to have to reinvent. So <laughs> that, nanometer, says, that sounds a ways down the road. That's a ways down the road, <laughs> right? So I think there's a practical limitation that we'll hit before that. And Bernie Meyerson uh, put his finger on it a, a number of years ago. And that's actually interconnect. So I think device, devices and device scaling and figuring out all the details and issues around that, including uh, you know, how do you make designs with huge variability in the device characteristics? Because as we start getting down there, we start getting into statistical distribution. Uh, you know, did I accidentally hit and have an ion impact put an impurity into the channel or not, right? You know, I'm counting tens of impurities. So we would be able to do that. However, the interconnect is probably likely to not uh, scale uh, anywhere close to that same level. And that's going to cause us some interesting challenges, right? We've, uh, we're, we've seen the introduction of air gaps. And uh, air gaps are about the best we can do in terms of an insulator. And um, I just don't know that we're going to see practical scaling much beyond the uh, six nanometer node. So I put kind of an end of traditional sort of silicon based uh, without really, really exotically something new coming in, probably around 2020. And I think it's uh, relatively close to the ITRS sort of roadmap uh, in terms of, of what we see there. That being said, non-traditional scaling is available. And Moore's Law says, you know, you double the effective uh, you know, density of transistors every 18 months. And if you can't do that in terms of a horizontal density, what, what options are available? I've been following for quite a while the, uh, the movement towards vertical integration, right? So what if, I've, what if my next process node for scaling of integration is not traditional scaling of devices and <coughs> performance of devices, but rather the vertical integration of chips into a stack? We've seen some very interesting movements. Uh, I think the first harbingers of that kind of technology starting to, to make pragmatic sense is the announcement from Samsung of its vertical memory stack of 8 die. And so we'll start to see some of the technical um, issues associated with vertical scaling as an element of scaling in the traditional sense of Moore's block complexity coming along. Now, with that, I think that, you know, sort of the, at the traditional base, I give ourselves sort of a, uh, let's call it a 12-year roadmap of, of, of scaling and, and working within the context of what you pointed out as a set of constraints around that. Design costs going up, the, the funny outcome of alchemical sort of mix of do I have a design in a marketplace with enough ability to manage my risk to invest 50, 80 million dollars up front and wait a period of time before I'm going to get a return. If that all works together, you're going to see people actually follow that curve, right? More and more people, however, I think are starting to look at other ways of differentiation and value creation. And I think the Apple iPhone is my best today example of that iPhone doesn't represent leading edge technology in almost any dimension that you look at that phone. And they're going after an, a new utilization of technology in a way that becomes embedded in the way that people live. And so I think that the scaling and the association of functional scaling, right, as a, as a corollary to Moore's Law's traditional sort of just count the number of devices, will start to be an interesting thing to track. And that scaling, as my good friend here, uh, Giovanni, is going to say, is not necessarily functional scaling only in terms of electrical components, but also the software and the, and the elements associated with that particular system. So, so, you know, I think, and as I talked with Brian, there's two ends of this spectrum with respect to Moore's Law. There's the low end, which is the traditional way that we look at scaling of, of manufacturing processes and the economics around in, uh, design and integration into that. And now the new scaling, which is associated with complexity on both the hardware and the software side, and your ability to manage large, complex projects and programs and being able to bring those to marketplace with a perceived uh, quality being very, very high for the combined system, right? Because a lot of the applications you're going into are not going into experts, you know? It's not like we put up with with our PCs where if it hangs up, we just sort of reboot it, right? It's going to be embedded in something that that's not going to be an option. 
and uh, you know, automatic downloads are not going to be a way that we're going to be able to manage the fact that the software has bugs in it. So I think we're going to see a lot more rigor and a lot more focus on functional complexity scaling as we go forward. So it sounds like it's really, it's just a couple of key companies that will try to push Moore's Law and the rest are probably going to try other ways. Absolutely. So, and, and like I said, it's that optimal mix, right? So if I have ASP, if I have volume, and, uh, you know, and I have a certain ability to project the market, because that's the other part that's going to be critically important going forward is I can't afford to not know exactly what market I'm going into and have some good assurances that I'm going to be able to get a return out of that market. So there's a risk profile that people are going to have to deal with. Sure.